Herzlich willkommen zurück, meine Damen und Herren, welcome zu dieser Nachmittagsrunde beim Deutsch-Französischen Energieforum. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie into our afternoon sessions um, of the Franco-German Energy Forum. And um, it's fantastic also to see a, a lot of people uh, following us online. We had 300 people in our chat room and uh, they were all discussing uh, the presentations. Um, now, this afternoon, we'll have uh, an exciting topic, the European energy transition in the context of current geopolitical challenges. And we have three very interesting uh, female speakers um, and we will start off with energy production and how uh, to reduce Europe's dependencies and uh, Camille Dufar is going to join us um, for this session and uh, she is a research fellow with a focus on EU energy policy at the Jacques Delors Institute and she's uh, before that um, been uh, working in um, the uh, financing efforts of African um, energy projects and um, Mr. Dufar the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to today's event. I've prepared a presentation, so I hope you can see that. I hope you can see that, uh, and I think you can. Well, we'll be talking about uh, European energy production and we'll take a look at how to reduce uh, European dependencies. First of all, I want to take a look at uh, where we stand and the current crisis, um, I think, has um, shown um, how vulnerable the European Union is um, in terms of energy. There's a lot of pressure um, to improve the situation. And secondly, I want to focus on solutions and um, solutions to strengthen our energy independence and to reduce uh, dependencies. So first of all, we are going to talk about um, phasing out certain um, fossil fuels, and then we'll talk about uh, in energy independence. So as you can see here, the share of oil and gas is a relatively small share of 11%. So what you can see here is that despite the fact that that's just 11%, uh, they make up 60% of our energy mix. So what you can see here is that 60% of um, energy used in Europe is imported from other countries. So that means we are dependent on, for example, Russia. Russia was um, the uh, largest supplier um, uh, up until very recently. What you can see here is uh, that we uh, get uh, almost 100% of our oil and um, almost uh, or a bit above 80% of our gas um, and we receive that via imports. We're going to focus on natural gas because that is where the current challenges um, are most uh, pressing. And on the right hand side you can see um, the uh, gas imports, um, which uh, actually have tripled in recent years, that um, has some, you know, a, a lot of um, uh, high costs as a consequence that has an impact on our economies as well. And our businesses are uh, affected by this. The reduction of Russian imports um, has uh, led to an increase in demand of uh, liquid uh, natural gas, LNG, that we receive um, uh, via uh, maritime transport. And we are competing with Asian countries on uh, receiving uh, LNG uh, deliveries worldwide. And that could pose uh, an issue going forward. We you know, might be facing um, this issue here um, when we talk about LNG. And as I mentioned, it's um, 
a high cost factor for us. That means that the high prices are driving inflation, for example, in Germany. So high energy uh, prices um, have ripple effects for the rest of the economy. What we can see here on uh, this slide um, is the role of um, gas in uh, the European energy sector. So one quarter of gas is used for power generation. We use about a quarter uh, for Uh, rather half for buildings and housing and um, about um, a third to a quarter uh, for businesses um, and uh, the industrial sector. So you can see the split here on the left hand side and on the right hand side you can see that all industrial sectors have tried to reduce um, gas demand and gas consumption. And that is, as you can see, true for most uh, members of the European Union. Uh, most European countries are facing these high prices, which means to a uh, leads to a reduction in demand, which means that there are necessities and then there are voluntary efforts to reduce uh, energy consumption. Governments in Europe do everything they can to reduce uh, energy consumption uh, in administrative buildings, for example. And that reduction in uh, consumption is, of course, a positive trend. But there are other measures um, that have been implemented to reduce energy needs due to the high energy prices and um, you know what i've got in mind is some um, for example producing aluminum producing glass products uh, that kind of production has declined in recent months due to the high energy prices that we've seen and there are a lot of concerns um, for these companies it is um, not easy to really distinguish between these um, factors that we've that forcibly reduce demand um, due to high prices or whether that was a, a voluntary reduction in energy consumption we're going to uh, move to the next slide on which uh, we can see the energy flows in the European Union in yellow or orange you can see uh, gas flows and in green we've got renewable energies and if we take a look at the left hand part of this chart um, you can see where dependencies lie you see that we have to reduce our gas imports in order to reduce dependencies and most of our gas is actually being imported and we can, I think, achieve that independence because we are importing less gas anyway. We have to strengthen domestic, national energy production. And in order to do that, we have to expand renewables. Now, if you take a look at the flow of uh, energy from left to right, you will see that most of the gas is uh, being used directly, so direct use. And everything else is usually um, used to uh, create some electricity. So uh, that means that a lot of different processes are being electrified. And that is an important step for the European Union to reduce its dependencies. Now, let's take a look at the right hand side of this chart. Um, what we can see here is the ultimate um, energy consumption, so the uh, end user consumption on the right hand side. And um, we have to reduce our energy use in order to reduce those uh, dependencies. And we have to uh, get uh, energy savings measures uh, on their way in order to achieve that. And if you have local energy demand, it's better to uh, cater to that demand by expanding renewable energies. This is a very pressing issue. It is a pressing issue to reduce dependencies. 
And it's important um, to do everything we can to reduce energy prices. A lot has already been uh, done to uh, fill up um, our uh, gas storage in uh, the past, and we have been able to get the necessary contacts um, for uh, LNG deliveries and um, to add that to our storage as well. And we've also seen that um, demand in uh, China is uh, going down as well. So all in all, we have, um, in fact, done a lot to diversify our energy mix uh, in order to lower imports. But with that strategy, uh, we have also seen new risks uh, arise, which might mean um, additional problems next year to source sufficient uh, LNG. Should, for example, the economy pick up in China, should it do that, we might see um, issues with uh, LNG deliveries in Europe. It could be up to um, uh, 30 um, BCM or 30 billion uh, cubic meters um, of gas um, that um, are going to be missing for us um, on, on the market. And uh, that means we have to prepare now for the coming winter and we have to increase um, our independence. We have to reduce demand and have to strengthen and diversify our energy mix. Here on this next slide, you can see how we uh, expanded uh, renewables and you can see here a variety of countries um, in the European Union and a lot of them are betting on solar energy and solar power. We've seen that um, the uh, political efforts um, to push this um, have um, uh, really uh, some promising results. We think that uh, we will be able uh, to expand this to 40 uh, gigawatts um, in uh, the coming years. And a report um, by the uh, EU uh, Commission um, laid out um, that it should be possible to double um, our share of renewables. There are still challenges, uh, of course. There are uh, supply bottlenecks um, to overcome. Uh, so first of all, we have to support expanding renewables and we will have to anticipate certain risks for our energy supply. What we can see here on the uh, next slide uh, is um, a very central element or factor in our uh, energy independence, and that is uh, energy savings. So we uh, really have to focus on that. We really have to take this into account. And uh, of course, we are importing a lot of gas that ultimately is being used to heat buildings that are just not very energy uh, efficient. So that means that there is a huge potential uh, there in uh, really increasing energy efficiency and uh, renovating older buildings. And doing that is uh, a requirement to uh, you know, become more efficient and use uh, energy for heating more efficiently. One potential solution that um, has been proposed and uh, has been promoted by governments uh, was uh, installing heat pumps in buildings. So we really have to push um, the uh, installation of heat pumps, but we have to use them efficiently as well. Now another option might be uh, that we use some um, thermal heating systems. Now if you have an older building and you want to continue using it, you have a high uh, energy costs and heating costs. So that is something that um, we have to tackle. But if you actually renovate those um, buildings and increase energy efficiency, then you can use uh, normal heating systems um, to heat those buildings. And uh, Guidehouse 22 uh, was uh, the study that uh, came to this uh, conclusion. Uh, and that showed that by 2030, we can actually use um, a very 
um, efficient tools at our disposal to move buildings that are currently categorized as a class F and G uh, and renovate them and turn them into buildings of uh, the classes B and C. Ça montre une, c'est une étude de, du think tank E3G qui a estimé que euh, le potentiel d'économie dans le bâtiment était plus important que la capacité. This slide is um, an uh, E3G 2022 um, study, and this study shows that there is huge potential when it comes to energy savings in buildings uh, by 2030. Uh, but what does that actually mean? Well, it means that the LNG that we are importing is energy that we could use to, for example, heat buildings. And that would, of course, uh, be uh, to uh, the benefit of our energy independence and would also at the same time reduce energy needs um, in uh, private households. So it's gas that can then be used uh, in industrial sectors as well. That means we can use different solutions to these issues, but also have to keep uh, energy savings in mind. So the answers are there. They are at our disposal. And we can use these answers uh, to overcome these challenges. We can also use these same tools uh, in order to uh, combat the rise in energy prices. For Europe, um, this means that um, governments have already been hard at work on this. And the Green Deal has been passed. Um, that is uh, really the best answer uh, to uh, these challenges um, and um, perhaps reducing uh, the uh, dependencies um, that Europe currently has. Now, in order to reduce demand in gas, we need more energy efficiency. And that really started with very ambitious legal frameworks that were proposed and that were passed. And the big step forward was the climate law that was passed in 2020, setting the target of reducing emissions by 35 percent by 2035. And what we've uh, realized is that our climate uh, targets and uh, our need um, for security go hand in hand and that at the same time we can reduce uh, energy uh, needs uh, and dependencies. Now all of that was um, ultimately um, something that was uh, taken into consideration for the uh, Fit for 55 uh, regulation. And um, that uh, was a proposal to uh, reduce emissions um, to uh, uh, up to minus 55 percent, going beyond the originally uh, planned uh, 29 percent uh, reductions. So assuming we're going to meet all those uh, targets, uh, we are going to ultimately achieve uh, 52 percent uh, reductions uh, all in all, as you can see on the right-hand side. We have set very ambitious uh, targets in the context of the uh, Green Deal. That is a very pressing matter, very urgent. Uh, we want to expand renewable energies uh, across Europe. We want to uh, increase um, energy efficiency. And all of uh, these uh, targets uh, are uh, indeed uh, going uh, to uh, are something that we're uh, going to strive for and um, the repower EU um, framework is also something that is going to help us achieve that um, we have um, stakeholders um, and um, actors uh, in uh, the European economies that are encouraged uh, uh, and incentivized um, to uh, reduce their energy needs for example reducing um, the average temperatures um, to 19 uh, degrees Celsius in public buildings. And these are uh, binding commitments um, that will allow us to reduce our energy demand across the board. So what's the challenge then? Well, 
we have to take sensible measures in order to reduce demand. Something that we've not put here on the slide um, is that it's still important to, when we think about Repower EU, for example, that that's a framework that supports a lot of infrastructure that is not necessarily in line with um, our long-term goals. On the uh, next slide, uh, I'm first of all going to tell you a bit about what policymakers uh, can and should do. I think we've already seen that um, you know we're really doing everything we can to uh, make up for lost time and to overcome this crisis of, of fossil fuels and uh, ultimately the goal is to become more independent to phase out fossil fuels we are still way too dependent on other countries and too dependent on fossil fuels there have been a lot of proposals a lot of recommendations um, a lot of measures that in part have already been implemented and that generally is good news um, uh, you know, some of those measures um, have been shared with the public. We've started working on some of those. Now it's really just uh, about expanding on that. And on the right-hand side, um, you uh, see a, a pyramid that is turned upside down. And that um, tells us a bit about what we should do with our energy. I mean, we've used um, large amounts of energy in the past. But today, it's a different situation. Um, we have... Um, a shortage of energy. So we have to ask ourselves what it is we can do. After the Fukushima disaster in Japan, they were able to reduce energy demand by 20%. So that is something that we have to do as well. We have to react to a crisis. We have to find new ways to save energy. Furthermore, we have to try and establish new social norms that help change mentalities and change mindsets. In Sweden, for example, people were um, uh, flight shaming others. So, so if, you, if they took too many flights um, and uh, traveled by plane too much, and now there's a certain public pressure on people not to heat their homes too much. And this is very much about energy efficiency as well. On the right-hand side, you can see here from top to bottom, uh, energy efficiency. So this is about... Um, really increasing efficiency of different kinds of infrastructure with the tools that I've mentioned. So we've developed a lot of those tools. Now it is um, very much about implementing Fit for 55, the Green Deal, and really moving that forward. There are you know, other ways to uh, you know, incentivize this, to move this forward. So it is also about providing the necessary financing that might mean uh, providing renovation loans, um, that might mean uh, subsidies uh, for uh, more technological solutions. Uh, and we also want to promote um, a just transition. Uh, I just transition that uh, could be supported by a uh, climate fund that supports uh, lower income households. Now, I'm uh, going to wrap up my presentation by saying that this crisis is a huge opportunity to become more competitive, to use climate-friendly new technologies. It is a great opportunity for our industries, our companies, and for consumers uh, in Europe. And the uh, situation can uh, really improve um, even further going forward. Thank you so much. Um, and let me just see if there are any questions uh, and uh, a short question and maybe a short answer. There is just one. 
Now, a question here about uh, Fit for 55. Um, so this program hasn't really been passed yet. Um, so there is a certain discrepancy there, a gap between the targets and the relatively slow political processes. How can you or how can we overcome this? Well, indeed, um, there is um, real pressure from a variety of, of stakeholders, um, and that means we have to really um, be even more ambitious. Now, when I look at the time frames, we probably have an advantage there with the Fit for 55 um, program, uh, looking at the end of this uh, decade um, uh, towards 2030. And uh, there is a lot of dynamic um, that we're currently seeing that can have positive impacts on the national level if we act um, with some foresight, um, especially in, in terms of um, uh, public efforts. And that would allow us to achieve our targets and they can be even more ambitious than they currently are. And I think there is an expectation, a new expectation uh, from all the stakeholders that have realized, both citizens and businesses alike, have realized that fossil fuels are, you know, are going to run out fairly quickly. And I think there are different levers that we can use in order to um, facilitate this uh, energy transition. Well, thank you so much, uh, Camille Defar. And uh, we now want to take a look at the energy grid, new actors and new challenges, how to accelerate the grid and market integration of uh, renewables. And I'm delighted to welcome Sonja Tvoik, Secretary General at uh, ENTSO-E, the European Network of Transmission Operators for Electricity, ENTSO, and they're headquartered in Brussels, um, and they're also aiming for a climate neutral continent. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, dear State Secretaries, dear Mr. Ambassador, dear ladies and gentlemen here today in the room and also online, um, it's a great honor for me to join you today on the occasion of the fifth edition of the Franco-German Energy Forum and to have the opportunity to present the views of the electricity transmission system operators on the role of grids in the energy transition. Uh, I am delighted to be here today. So, what do, we, what do we have to talk about? We have a lot to talk about today, uh, because in, indeed we have a very uncertain future, an uncertain situation, but we also have opportunities. Uh, and the topics that we have already heard this morning in terms of policy developments uh, are indeed a cause for action and a cause for us as TSOs to work forward on that. We are facing certain, certainly uncertain times now, but th and the current geopolitical circumstances have challenged the norm. They've challenged the norm. And uh, they've challenged very much the reliability and the security uh, of supply of Europe uh, today. At the same time, though, we have a commitment to decarbonize. And that commitment is as strong as it was uh, before this year began. This same commitment is at the same time revisiting some of our established business models, the way we work, the way we assume things, and for the various actors from the energy uh, system to come into four. Today, more than ever, uh, it's a critical time to address the energy transition dilemma or trilemma, consisting of uh, energy supply on the one side from decarbonized sources, and at the same time remaining affordable to all. The transmission grids play a crucial role in moving the electrons from the generation sources to the distribution grids and ultimately to us as consumers. And this is with no interruption. Uh, and our goal as TSOs is to provide the necessary infrastructure to integrate more variable renewable sources, accommodating them at the same time as this new system of flexibility comes on stream. 
However, we are achieving this carbon neutral power system in Europe. It will require changes, how we produce, how we deliver and consume electricity. At ENSO, we, we take this mission very seriously and we are working on making this happen very smooth and very fast. Today, I would like to share with you the perspective from the electricity system operators, in particular the challenges, but also opportunities, in order to integrate renewable sources. Our work has defined a number of types of flexibility solutions uh, that could be implemented as well as meeting the necessary measures from a market design perspective and overall to achieve a carbon neutral Europe. I'm going to talk about flexibility. We all like to talk about flexibility, but what really do we mean? Well, what's good about this year is that we have to talk about short and longer term flexibility, and we need both. Firstly, to balance the system in real time and within a day, we will require management of very steeper evening ramps, so very changes in solar and in wind, and we will need to manage what they call system inertia, which is a technical term for saying how heavy the system is. The more renewables on the system, the lighter the system becomes and the harder it is to manage from an electrical perspective. There will be periods of overgeneration, of undergeneration, and so within day, the short-term flexibility is crucial. But there's also the longer term perspective, where there may be days, months of certain types of weather patterns, and these of course need also to be accommodated. It's very much the case that a decarbonized renewables-based power system is essentially more technically challenging, but it also has, as I said, the opportunity to bring to fore the innovation that we see uh, in Europe. In terms of, to address these flexibility needs, we will need the full spectrum to be assessed in terms of flexibility solutions. Uh, for example, during periods with relatively stable re renewable generation, as shown in the top part of this chart, short duration flexibility sources, such as demand response to batteries, electric vehicles, will be sufficient to compensate lower uh, renewable energy uh, over a few hours. However, the lower part of the graph shows you where lower amounts of renewable generation, which persists over multiple days, the energy stored here in batteries will be quickly depleted. And therefore, demand response will have a limited support to peak shaving. So again, what we're seeing here is that we need to tailor the service that is going to be offered in the industry towards the needs of the, the power system. Uh, of course, this implies longer duration flexibility sources such as hydrogen and the hydrogen uh, on and uh, developments here are very interesting in this regard. Let's talk about infrastructure. Of course, uh, the TSO is managing a grid, the DSO managing a distribution grid. Uh, very important to have infrastructure for what we want to achieve and to meet the ambitions that we have. In terms of NSOE, we have a 10-year network development plan. We, we release them every two years. This is 2022. You see her on, the, on your left. Uh, and you will see, for instance, that in, by 2040 that we will invest, or the intention is to invest over 6 billion euros in infrastructure upgrades. Now, of course, upgrades, new lines, and various offshore initiatives. Uh, this will be carried out by a mixture of the TSO, but also uh, other operators and third-party promoters on the system. And of course, it's very important to say that this is a holistic plan. This is a plan for all the developers across Europe. What we would say is that in terms of our economic assessment is that this 6 billion euro investment will deliver back in socio-economic benefits 9 billion euros. And this is the most important thing about why infrastructure is needed. It will deliver socio-economic benefits. Uh, you see here on the right, and we talk somewhat of the offshore potential. And we have, of course, in Europe, offshore, lots of offshore uh, potential. You have their five corridors mentioned. Um, and it's very uh, warming to hear from the ministers, the ministries to hear about the offshore developments at ministerial level, because indeed we do need interjurisdictional support to deliver on the offshore aspects. Um, this is a very interesting development, as I said. In terms of market design, it's sort of a buzzword and a lot of people have a view on it. Prices are very high, 
what shall we do? Shall we throw it all out? Shall we, what shall we do? So we also need to reform a market design for sure. And of course, it can deliver appropriate signals once it's clearly designed that way. Uh, it should deliver an investment signal. It should deliver infrastructure. It should be stimulating in terms of flexibility and for facilitating a more complex system operation. To simplify it from the perspective of NSOE, we can break down the power system needs into three major categories. The first is that we do need a long-term investment signal to ensure adequacy and long-term flexibility, like I mentioned. Secondly, we need to have the price signal for the day ahead, intraday and balancing markets to dispatch the most efficient generation resource and again to stimulate more short-term flexibility and demand response. But finally, we also have a system that needs to reflect that it is a system and therefore it has services and congestion management into, into managing grid capabilities. But of course, one of the things that we must all admit is that the design has to meet the needs of the consumer. And the consumer has to be at the heart of a new market reform and market design. The voice of this consumer right now is uh, questionable, <laughs> uh, to say the least, but certainly this is something that this market design needs to deliver on. It's what shall we give back in terms of a market design fit for this carbon neutral system? And for, sh for sure, the design that we have now did not foresee or did not consider all the elements of what a market design needs to do and achieve. Firstly, we need to rethink today's market design without destroying it all. Okay? We need to take what works and build on that for future. Because time is of the essence, and uh, as anyone knows well across the world, and redesigning a market is not a very straightforward thing to do, and it takes a lot of time if, if you want to re redo everything. We need to make markets that allocate value, the value uh, and the right signals, especially adequacy, having enough generation, the right generation, but also the flexibility of that generation and the resilience of it uh, under particular system stress. This implies stronger, longer-term investment signals for both renewable energy sources, but also complementary resources. And so we need to ensure that we have both complementary and renewable sources. In the short term, it needs to be an efficient signal, especially where we're talking about where it's dispatched, consumed, and flexibility, so where the demand is now. Okay, think about how that signal can be help for the demand that it's to, to meet. An efficient use of the grid capability is also a factor in this market design and stronger what we call locational signals for that grid capability. But lastly, and as I said, the market design should facilitate consumer engagement and emergence of new services for the consumer. But we have to remain at very much core the value of affordability, simplicity and consumer protection at its heart. What shall we say about the vision? For NSOE, it's a very bright future. It's a future in terms of electricity being the main and the most efficient energy carrier. And it will need to be coupled with other energy sectors, of course. Uh, and we just saw there in the previous presentation, buildings and, and refit of buildings, which is a very interesting development for sure. The system of the future should be based on three essential capabilities. The first is that it should facilitate carbon neutral energy sources, providing the bulk of the power system generation. And to acknowledge that it is very much weather dependent type of energy source. In contrary or in complement to that, we need system flexibility resources to efficiently manage this energy dependent weather system, um, energy system. And of course, that means reflecting the variability of generation and consumption and in overall handling that system complexity. In the end, we have a power grid to manage. We need to connect people. We need to make uh, that transport work in terms of electrons. And of course, we need to make sure that is integrated in Europe. That is our objective, full interconnection. Finally, it's a system of systems. And of course, the importance of working with all of our parties, both the distribution system operators, all the uh, aggregators and all the different players within Europe. This is essentially one system and a, and a meeting of, other, of systems together.
We are at the same time both European and local, and that's, that's, our, that's our goal. So, final slide, our vision. How do we get there? Uh, well, we need to turn everything that's a challenge into an opportunity, for sure. <laughs> um, and so what we would say is there needs to be four major changes. A rapid development of system flexibilities, and even more rapid now because of the year that we've had with the year that we are experiencing, uh, both short and long term to smooth and phase out renewables, or phase out fossil fuel generation. We need a more dynamic system operation, interacting horizontally with other sectors, vertically with decentralized solutions. We need a regulatory framework that supports planning, permitting and financing of all the necessary investments at much faster pace than what we've seen. Uh, and this is w all the while of increasing efficiency and innovation uh, in our sectors. And finally, we need a market design that allocates value in line with what the system needs and the consumer's preferences. And finally, we need to act now. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Sonja Twoig, für diese, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Sonja Twoig, for this um, vision. I'm looking into the auditorium. Do you have any questions to this presentation? Do you have uh, the floor. You will be brought a microphone. Please introduce yourself briefly. From the Steinbach uh, from EDW. How do you um, decide economic success then for the TSOs? I mean, lots of stuff here for the market, for the consumers, for the market design, but what would you say um, defines economic success in 10 years for the TSOs? Well, uh, we have an economic, we, we conduct economic modeling and the TYNDP has a we have a number of haben wirtschaftliche Modelle und haben bestimmte the sustainability and the protection. These are, these are yeah, parameters that we play in the economic model, of course. But essentially, it's, it's down to price and the effectiveness of what we're producing in terms of the scenarios we're modeling. But uh, yes, in, essentially, we have an economic model and we, we, we de deliver essentially an output that says, you know, how sustainable are these, these energy solutions? Of course, this is, this is a Paris system that will cost money. This is a, a, an objective that costs money. So it is an important part of the, the modeling is to be, to acknowledge that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a dichotomy with the consumer at the moment. And perhaps even in the overall sense, we need to address that. What is the final uh, value to consumers and how does that consumer wish to pay for such a system? And so this is something that we, we have to, in a policy sense, look at. Uh, but we're, as NCOE, we providing that economic assessment. We're providing the needs of the system in terms of electricity consumption and usage uh, with the goals of decarbonization. Um, and I guess it's, it's for the policy makers to assess how we can finally achieve that. Yeah, yeah. Das weitere Fragen, ich sehe, ah, ich sehe Fragen aus dem Chat. Are there any further questions? I see a question in the chat group. The, net, the European network, grid network is being um, updated every two years and um, is being adapted to the news to developments. How is this process being coordinated? Okay, it is being coordinated by all of the TSOs in Europe. So we're talking about 39 system operators across Europe all of their uh, data in terms of their development of their network to meet the targets of renewables and uh, energy uh, efficiency are brought into this plan. We have scenarios for the future, for 2040, for, for the future, and the projects that are delivered as part of that will be uh, provided in one, in, one, uh, in one output. So, in fact, uh, the output of the TYNDP is a coordination across all 
uh, operators across Europe of what are the network uh, plans and network develops out for the next 10 years. So, but it also uh, involves projects of common interest, which are member states, mutual interest with non-EU uh, operators as well, so non-EU, uh, and also, as I said, third party promoters who are themselves developing network capability uh, in a third party sense. So it is a yeah, it's a complete uh, melange of all of those things and uh, we bring together this into one plan and show as part of the TYDP the output of that plan. Of course, it can show, highlight certain areas that need further expansion or that it is unclear exactly how the network developments will be sequenced, but this is part of the output of the plan is to assess what is what is coming to the fore in terms of investment um, and therefore uh, very much so that it is a it is a complete picture of investment developments across europe yeah. mm -hmm. there is another question from the chat there is a dilemma between the uh, bottlenecks in the grid um, with the wind energy for instance how would you overcome this dilemma so I guess the, uh, the experience across Europe uh, can be useful here. Uh, of course, uh, permitting is more local and is developed at jurisdictional level, and it relies upon obviously more state support in terms of the uh, strategic investment that needs to be made and the support of that. In terms of how you deal with the lead time question, so the lead time to actually connect in renewables could be much faster than the ability to build transmission to, to take uh, the offset. So in, in, in other parts of Europe, and where I come from in Ireland, they would uh, try to link the permitting processes together so that at least the lead time is more uh, together uh, and that the ability to connect any renewable generation is itself uh, not waiting for a transmission line. It is trying to bring it in a sort of cohesive lead time sense. Uh, but there are many other ways to handle, to handle that. Uh, but essentially what you can find is just that dislocation between connecting in multiple sources and the transmission line not being available to offshoot it. Uh, but in our TYNDP now, we look at other methods than transmission line, new lines, etc. We look at uprates, we also look at other innovations about how you can optimize existing lines to bring forward the uh, uh, offtake of, of, of new generation. So uh, this is something very new within the TYNDP as well, which is also to look at these innovations in terms of trying to fast track the connections themselves. I am struck by the solar developments this year and also in Germany with the acceleration that's seen and, and very much from a TSO perspective and DSO, because a lot of these will be connected to distribution level, uh, the need to uh, work much more quicker and faster on this is something that the, the operators are very, very key, uh, keen to address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have another, another question concerning Ukraine. In March 2022, uh, we've seen that Ukraine is connected to the European grids and Ukraine has uh, um, its own um, electricity capacities and would like also to expand its uh, capacity to use renewables. How strongly is it already connected to the European grids and what are the biggest challenges for future integration of Ukraine? Uh, Ukraine has, uh, and for many, many years, a very strong process of uh, manage of uh, joining with Europe and also with the objectives of Europe in terms of decarbonisation. Um, in terms of now, today, it is physically connected with continental Europe and indeed uh, continental Europe supplies Ukraine and Moldova where needed. Um, very difficult circumstances at this moment in time with the huge damage to the Ukrainian system and the challenges to the Moldovan power system as well. What I can say is that uh, the objectives of both Ukraine and Moldova to decarbonize their system are as strong as our commitment uh, and our willing our support and uh, commitment towards uh, both uh, both countries is there in terms of facilitating further developments. Um, we are talking about, in some cases, obviously a reconstruction program of their network and generation. And so therefore, 
it would be uh, good, obviously, to apply, you know, good uh, innovations and, uh, you know, fast tracking of various uh, energy sources to do so. So, at this point in time, the TSOs are working very hard to support both uh, Ukraine and Moldovan uh, power system operators. They have a more immediate issue to solve, uh, but as soon as uh, they can, they will be back on track with their own objectives to decarbonize their power systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vielen Dank, Sonja. Thank you very much, Sonja, for these very interesting explanations about the grid in Europe. Thank you very much. Und ich freue mich sehr, die dritte Rednerin dieses And I am delighted to greet our third speaker here today. Professor Veronica Grimm, who will speak about uh, residential and commercial energy prices. What is the cost of geopolitical dependencies and who bears it? Professor Grimm is head of the Chair of Economics at the University of Erlangen, but she also has many other hats that she wears. Uh, she leads the Hydrogen uh, Center in Bavaria and uh, also is part of uh, the economic assessment body and other uh, bodies. She is particularly known as of October this year, the latest, as co-chair of uh, the expert commission on gas and heating, who worked on the gas price cap in Germany. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, it's uh, great to be joining you, unfortunately, just remotely. Um, and um, I sent uh, your colleagues a couple of slides, and I think they are being shared with you right now. Um, so this is about um, the uh, impact for businesses, for households, uh, and the geopolitical dependencies, um, and um, you know not just what the cost is, but um, who bears it. So what we can see here, that's the situation that um, we looked at before the uh, Russian attack on Ukraine. Um, and um, especially when we take a look at uh, Russian gas, but overall there were uh, huge dependencies and um, we received that uh, gas uh, via pipelines and um, it uh, wasn't really possible to replace that uh, quickly. So that's the uh, consequence. Um, of that um, development, uh, Russian gas supplies have been reduced and then almost uh, uh, reduced to, to zero. So we have uh, seen high demand. We've seen uh, the uh, changes um, here uh, in prices as well. And uh, when we, uh, you know, took a look at uh, inflation, we uh, tried to figure out, um, you know, what it was driven by, and we've realized that it was uh, driven by energy prices and uh, driven by high demand after the uh, COVID crisis uh, because it had gone down during COVID. And um, this is um, a level of uh, demand that could not be met with supplies because there were certain challenges there. So ultimately, we'd seen an, a level of uh, inflation that has uh, now had an impact on uh, consumer prices, on uh, products uh, pricing. And it's not going to go away from one day to another either. So this does have an impact on private households. Uh, that is uh, an additional burden for households. And if we take a look um, at uh, energy prices um, here, we can take a look at the uh, left hand side, the gas prices. Uh, they have um, almost uh, uh, increased uh, by a factor of 10. Uh, and these high prices um, are also due to the fact that transporting gas uh, to uh, Europe um, is challenging and we expect prices uh, to remain high uh, till 2024 even. That's what the spot markets currently tell us. Uh, up to the point where we will be able to transport gas supplies uh, to Europe in sufficient amounts. So we have a gas um, uh, short it's not not an entire shortage um, but we just don't have enough and that is something that uh, private households and uh, businesses start to feel 
and that is something that a lot of companies um, felt early on because um, they are uh, sourcing their gas uh, directly from suppliers. Now, private households, they uh, oftentimes have long-term contracts, so they are step by step being renewed, and that means that now, as contracts are being renewed, the higher prices are passed on to consumers as well. And that was one of the reasons uh, why uh, the uh, Gas and Heating Commission uh, was put in place to figure out ways to um, really lift the burden off of uh, private households to a certain extent of these increase, uh, increased prices, gas prices and heating prices. On the next slide, um, we can see our projections um, in terms of uh, GDP uh, growth. Um, that's 1.8% uh, that we're projecting for March uh, 2022. That's the last projection. And um, we're projecting pretty much the same going forward. Uh, due to the fact uh, that the economic situation has worsened, um, but not by that much. Um, so for 2022, it's almost the same, uh, but there has been a downward revision for 2023. Um, we started with 1.8% uh, uh, growth, um, and now we expect this uh, to be down by 0.2% uh, in 2023. Uh, so. Um, that um, is uh, a considerable uh, downward uh, revision. And that was uh, driven very much uh, by higher energy prices. Um, and um, also, as we can see now, by um, core inflation uh, developments, because, of course, these high energy prices um, are factored into prices for services and for goods, which means that this is going to increase uh, further and uh, the uh, restriction of monetary policy is going to have an impact on that as well. Now, there are measures um, to be taken to uh, lift the burden um, off of uh, businesses and uh, private households. Uh, and here we can see measures that were already taken in 2022. Um, namely, uh, people saved gas, um, saved energy, and companies saved um, uh, in uh, terms of energy uh, consumption. So. As you can see here, compared to um, a, a period um, in the years prior, we've seen 15 to 30 percent uh, savings uh, per month. That is due to savings uh, in the industrial sector, but also due to savings in private households. But that also has to do with um, uh, the weather and temperatures um, throughout the year. So this is something that we don't really want to see counteracted um, uh, by um, support programs. Um, so we've seen savings um, in the industrial sector and households. Efforts were being made, and we didn't really want to see that counteracted. Um, and um, in a lot of areas, you can save a lot of gas by switching to a different energy source. So if someone for example, was using coal, a Volkswagen in uh, Wolfsburg, for example, uh, they sold their gas hedge and they're currently still using coal and they're going to shift to gas later, uh, which means that the pricing pressure on gas is going to be lower as there's just more gas available. And um, as I said, you don't really want to pass any other uh, measures uh, countering these positive developments. Then we've seen uh, a restrictive monetary policy that um, has been in place um, for some time now. That is something that uh, 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 most uh, economies uh, um, did um, in the past uh, and uh, started uh, working on. And this had, had, uh, has had an impact um, because uh, these uh, developments have not followed suit um, with inflation. So uh, real uh, wages are down by 4%. Um, and that means that um, we, we shouldn't really or we don't have to expect uh, um, a uh, um, increase in wages that leads to an increase in inflation, which again leads to an increase in wages. So. Um, that being said, on the next slide, um, 
we can take a look at the expansion of renewable energies. Uh, we can see here the uh, plans um, by the German government. And should we uh, meet those uh, goals, um, the renewable uh, energy expansion is going to contribute greatly uh, to uh, reducing price pressures uh, in the energy market. Um, we can see this here on the right-hand side, the futures um, for energy um, and as we now get uh, uh, the uh, price break um, for energy prices um, that is going to have an impact um, and renewables also means that we can expand supply in uh, energy and that is something that we can see in particular on the next slide um, now expanding supply that could happen via renewables but it is also uh, important to to mention that um, you know, should we meet those uh, targets, um, and there still is some hesitation uh, about investing. But even assuming we meet those uh, targets, um, in the short term, it is going to be necessary to uh, uh, bring capacities online via power plants um, or continue um, using existing power plants. We have three nuclear power plants that are now uh, going to be used um, um, for um, a bit longer than originally planned. We have coal-fired um, power plants that uh, had been part of the uh, reserve um, power um, generation. That is now being used as well in order to lower uh, price pressures uh, on the market, which I think is an important step because we uh, think that this um, price pressure is going to continue for a while. And uh, there's a similar situation uh, in uh, France as well, where we don't expect all the uh, uh, nuclear power plants that are currently um, not uh, connected to the grid to come online again um, at the same time. So what we can see on the left-hand side is that the gas price in the United States has uh, more or less remained fairly low. And in Europe and in Asia, uh, gas prices have uh, increased uh, uh, tremendously. Um, and that was a very similar development in Europe and Asia because we are competing against one another uh, for um, these sources of energy. And um, many countries, the United States as well, have uh, limited capacities uh, to uh, export uh, LNG um, and limited uh, capacities to, to liquefy their gas uh, to prepare it for export which is the reason why uh, gas prices in the uh, United States are low and are high in Asia and in Europe. And we've also seen uh, the uh, spot prices here, the oil price um, that has gone up, but not as uh, much uh, and not to the same extent as gas prices. Now, those consumers or companies that need uh, gas, um, they will experience um, a higher level of cost increases um, compared to other parts um, of um, the uh, population of other uh, stakeholders. And um, on the next slide, we'll see um, you know, what we did um, with um, those figures. If we can take a look at the next slide. Can take a look at the next slide, please. And I don't really think that the slides changed yet. Wenn Sie einmal die Folie wechseln, die nächste Folie illustriert, wie die Gaspreisbremse konzipiert so ist. Ich uh, kann ja schon mal anfangen. Uh, price break um, that we'll hopefully then see on the next slide. Ah, there we go. That's that's the correct one. Now, as as part of um, our deliberations um, in our commission, we've. Uh, tried to, to meet a variety of, of goals. We wanted to um, ease the burden on uh, companies and private households, um, while at the same time not really aiming for this historic uh, low in prices, um, trying to reduce that or taking that as a baseline, but um, using the new normal um, as a baseline. So this is going to be double what it costs uh, in the United States. And it is also going to be twice as much as uh, our historic uh, prices. And that's the new normal that you can see here, this black uh, line or black bar that you can see. And we wanted to reduce prices to this new baseline 
in a way that would still incentivize uh, stakeholders to save energy, to save gas. And we figured one way to do that would be to uh, pay this out as a one-off payment to consumers, so easing the burden on them. And that's the gray area here on the left-hand side, so we're reducing that. I mean, if you could move back to the slide uh, prior to this. Um, so that was the, the level of reductions. Now, if you could move back one slide. Well, we uh, wanted to reduce prices, um, going back to this baseline new normal, but do this in a one-off payment, um, because consumers that are saving energy still receive savings based on the market price, because they don't have to pay back any of um, those supports uh, should they consume less than that. So that would meet both targets. Um, we would, on the one hand, ease the burden on companies and private households, while at the same time um, maintaining the incentive to save gas. Now, on the next slide, you can see what happens if you push both of um, those efforts uh, on supply and demand side. Okay, um, let's just try moving, moving on to the next um, slide. Um, so assuming you take measures both on the supply side and on the demand side, so you source more gas and you save gas on the other hand, um, that that's the slide um, I was referring to. So that is actually the level of reductions that you need. So you have overall um, a lower gas uh, consumption and you can see what uh, the government has to uh, invest uh, in order to reduce the price. And that is of course something that you're trying to achieve um, if uh, demand uh, goes down. So you have to have both of these uh, types of measures go hand in hand. Now on this slide that we can see now, um, you can see the measures um, that uh, can go beyond this uh, gas price break, especially on the left hand side. Uh, we can see that um, the impact of inflation on uh, lower income private households, that's at the very left, we can see low income households. On the right, uh, we can see the uh, high income households. And we can see that for uh, low income households, that they are more impacted by high inflation than higher income households, simply due to the uh, fact that uh, people consume what they consume that has an impact um, on the uh, consequences of inflation for them and that also means that low income households um, are uh, very much suffering from inflation because they have to do that in order to consume goods um, and um, a higher income households use a lower share of their income um, for uh, the consumption of goods and they are uh, thereby suffering less from high inflation. And that means that we have to implement very targeted uh, measures and to target these measures at those households, the low uh, income households that are suffering from high infla inflation rates and that are not able uh, to uh, really overcome these uh, challenges themselves. Um, and that is, um, you know, our um, thinking uh, behind uh, the gas price break and the uh, electricity price break. What we can see here is a summary of uh, our measures that uh, we've proposed. Um, one is um, the uh, limit um, to uh, price increases, um, saving energy, reducing energy prices, uh, and supporting this uh, with uh, measures uh, passed by the government, then also um, cushioning um, of the economic burden here, um, 
lightening that uh, burden uh, in order to um, support them, really making ends, ends meet despite these increased uh, costs, uh, and then also supporting low-income households uh, in the context um, of, um, you know, for example, establishing a specific um, fund for them. Yeah, on this slide here, we see the situation at businesses. Um, now, if you look at competitiveness and looking at the level of support that they need, you have to take a very close look at uh, the situation on two different levels. Um, for one, you have companies that use a lot of um, energy and you have companies that do not use a lot of energy, so not very energy um, uh, intensive. And especially in the uh, industries like steel or chemicals uh, production, especially in those um, uh, sectors, um, they have a very high share of uh, energy costs as part of their overall uh, cost uh, matrix. For others, less um, um, energy intensive uh, businesses, they have a lower share of energy um, as part of their cost mix. Um, that means that any support um, has to be adapted uh, to that and companies can, to some extent, pass on these uh, higher energy costs uh, to consumers. And that is um, something that um, would uh, bring with it a lot of uh, administrative um, costs. Uh, and that means that um, basically all companies um, are open to and welcome to join uh, these or apply for um, these uh, supports and um, if a company receives any um, financial support or subsidies they would have to guarantee that they are going to uh, um, keep operating at their respective um, location and um, that means of course in the long term companies are going to be affected uh, to uh, different extents by uh, high energy uh, prices and that also means that the level of uh, subsidies being paid out are going to vary. They are however capped uh, due to EU legislation and the gas price break will also be implemented in a way that uh, maintains an incentive to save uh, energy as I mentioned. We can see here some comparisons uh, here. We can see um, industries and uh, the uh, share of um, energy costs to profitability so we can see which uh, companies um, would be most affected and this very much depends on the uh, industry uh, that you're looking at and even within uh, any one industry um, there is a lot of variation so this is um, difficult to, to implement um, based on individual applications by companies um, and um, this is something again that is generally open um, to, to all um, of uh, these companies here. Now wrapping up my uh, presentation I would also like to touch upon further uh, dependencies um, that um, have an impact on economies and uh, the uh, GDP development and these are dependencies on uh, uh, rare resources uh, and uh, uh, components, upstream components that uh, companies depend on for their production. And that's also a level of dependence that we have to tackle uh, in the months uh, to come. So I think the issue is well understood in the context of um, energy, but we really also have to look at uh, uh, rare resources uh, and uh, upstream components and tackle that issue as well. Thank you so much, um, and um, I'd uh, of course be delighted to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Grimm. Um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, uh, sharing your insights uh, and um, the insights of the German Council of Economic Experts. Uh, and let's see if there are any questions. There are questions. In our online chat, the first question, why have energy prices actually increased before the Russian attack on Ukraine? Well, that was due to the fact that Russia uh, reduced uh, its uh, energy uh, uh, supply to Europe um, even before its attack. I mean, they switched contracts in 2018 and um, they uh, no longer 
uh, entered into long-term uh, contracts uh, with the European Union. Uh, the European Union was looking at uh, more short-term contracts um, uh, on the energy market, um, which led to Russia still meeting its uh, contractual obligations, um, but at the same time lowering the amount of gas um, that they um, transported uh, to uh, Europe. And that again meant that uh, gas storage uh, was not refilled to uh, historic levels. Um, and especially when we look at gas storage, um, we should have noticed um, that um, in, in recent years that uh, they were at uh, lower levels than before. And in 2021, this already had an impact. Well, there's another question, uh, Ms. Grimm. Now the, uh, gas price break is something you explained. What about electricity prices? Well, when it comes to electricity prices, we um, want to pursue a similar approach to the gas price break. At least that's the plan. Now, when we talk about electricity and financing, um, this is supposed to be uh, used um, or supposed to be implemented by uh, using um, the uh, profit that some companies um, have been able to generate on the markets due to the high prices and that is going to pose um, you know a, a challenging issue uh, because this um, is something that we've not fully seen um, companies have not invested fully because they don't know about the exact framework um, that they're going to operate in so we'll have to to wait and see on that Ms. Grimm, thank you so much um, we will have to, to move on, I'm afraid. Um, but thank you so much for, for joining us um, today. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would uh, like you to come back now after the coffee break um, at 3.45 p.m. So please come back in about half an hour. And now we've got our coffee break coming up.